We cannot out-strategize, out-smart challenge. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when. You're really known as the expert in resilience. It's really scary to tell those resilient stories. This is a really important, meaningful journey that we're all on, and it also gets really hard at certain points. The reality of like, this is not perfect, and I am Girl. struggling daily. <laughs> there was a period of six to seven months where I thought I was gonna lose my house. I was very concerned about how that would diminish my credibility when it actually drew people in and made them want to be a part of this conversation. We get to write the narrative of what that story actually means to us. Everybody, make sure you're hearing this because this is so powerful. Taryn, welcome to Powerhouse Women. Hello. It's thank so, you so much. This is like so long overdue and such a long time coming. Oh. And to get to sit down in person is my favorite. So mm. I'm so grateful that this worked out. Oh, well, thank you. I am so honored and delighted to be here. We've already had so much fun this morning. I know we really have. There have been gifts. There have been new props, new podcast props that mm -hmm. we got to test out. Mm -hmm. I mean, where could this go from here? We it's don't even know. Only up from here. Yeah, only, only up, up from here. So I have been devouring your content mm. and your research and all the interviews that you've done. And it's such an important topic for us to unpack for people because it's not an if, it's a when. We'll need some of these skills, but you're really known as the expert in resilience. Mm. And I, I feel like the more I've dug into this topic, the more I realize I never had a proper definition of resilience or never actually took the time to define what that means for me or how it affects my life. How do you define what resilience is now, given all the research that you've done? Mm, I love that we're starting here and and same, right? Because mm -hmm. this actually came out of me just thinking, wow, resilience, that seems like something important, something we should know about, something that I should be able to identify when it shows up in my life. And then I'm flipping through the dictionary and it's really circular. It's like, well, resilience means to be resilient and resilient means to demonstrate resilience. And I was like, ah, that's helpful. This is not helpful, you know? And yeah. so it really, in, in part, took me on a quest to understand more about how do we language what resilience is? So the definition that I've come to after two decades of this work, I know, doesn't seem like I I was like, we we actually share the same birthday, but I thought <laughs> we were day. Yeah, I thought we were we were actually birthday twins because I love you for you, this. Yes. Yes. That's yes. That's just goes without saying. Mm, thank you so much. <laughs> just a just a couple years apart yeah that's yeah. it we're just mm -hmm. like sisters just mm -hmm. a hop skip and a jump exactly <laughs> i love it i love it well and it's so it's really about challenge change and complexity or the big mm -hmm. three c's as i call them they are going to show up in our lives mm -hmm. and you already alluded to this it's not if it's going to happen it's when this is the fabric of what it means to be human, we cannot out strategize, out smart challenge. It's going to show up in our lives. And so given that that's going to happen, resilience is really about showing up for these moments in our lives and over time, allowing these experiences to form us, to mm -hmm. even enhance us rather than diminish us. Mm -hmm. Which, oh, there's just so much here. And I you know, I'm even in a season right now of some challenge dealing with like a loss in my life. And you realize in that moment that it's so much about what we decide. And you have this great distinction of I'm going to I'm going to probably butcher the words that you use and I'll have you tell us what they actually are. But there's like the, the what happened. But then there's the narrative, the story that we tell ourselves mm. about it. And it's like that's very real in even like present in my life right now. And I realize that that is one of the qualities that as I've worked on myself, as I've learned about how to be a resilient person, even though I didn't 
label it that, that that is one of the things that has helped me to keep moving through and learning from the challenging things that happen. Mm, I love that that's been so meaningful for you. That means so much to me. And it's been so helpful in my own life. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we get to recognize as women, as entrepreneurs, as powerhouse women, is that none of us are getting out of this thing without Mm -hmm. many resilient stories. Not just one, but many stories. And I think so often as women, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, it's really scary to tell those resilient stories. It's Mm -hmm. really scary to stand up and say like, things in the business aren't going the way I thought they would. You know, this is a lot harder than I imagined it would be. Cash flow isn't where I want it to be, Mm -hmm. you know, right now. And I've got, you know, all kinds of entrepreneurial stories I can share about my own journey. Mm. And I think when we can take a step back and recognize that The story of our entrepreneurial journey, of trauma we've experienced, of losses that we've had, this is the series of events that happens. We can think about that happening to us. We can think about that happening for us, through us, right? Um, But this is the story. And then we get to write the narrative of what that story actually means to us or the story about the story, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that I think is really one of the ways that we get to take back our power to be empowered as women to say, these are the facts and figures of what happened. And this is the narrative that I'm going to tell about the story. This is the strength that Mm -hmm. I demonstrated. This is the perseverance. This is the gumption that I found inside of me in that moment when I most needed it. Mm -hmm. And these are such powerful stories, not just to show ourselves and our family members and our children and our friends what we're capable of, but as entrepreneurs and business owners to get to tell these stories broadly Mm -hmm. so that we can not only share how we've persevered with our with our brand with our business but also to encourage others Mm -hmm. you know and the last thing that I'll just say about that is as I have really spent a lot of time thinking about you know the concept of story I am just convinced that it's even more powerful than we know or think and we know it's really powerful but when we think about taking some of the darkest times in our lives doing our own work, right? The integration, the healing, the making meaning of that. And then when we retell our resilient stories, it becomes a light Mm -hmm. that we shine on someone else's path that's coming up behind us. So we can effectively take some of the darkest times in our lives and alchemize that into a light that shines on other people's paths in the moment when they need that encouragement the most. Mm. The way that you articulated that, not only is that so beautiful and so true, and when I think when I think about the stories that have impacted me most, they aren't the pretty sunshine and rainbows story in someone else's life. It's it's a story that meets me in a current moment of struggle or challenge or pain and shows me that there is maybe some sunshine on the other side, but that I'm not alone in experiencing that, whether it's in entrepreneurship, because there are a whole lot of struggles, or as a living, breathing human being on this planet who's interacting with other human beings. So I I do want to dive so much more into how people can really connect with these stories that we may we may be hesitating to share right now, but there's Mm -hmm. a really powerful story that you have a TED talk that you share. It's in your Mm -hmm. book. And I think it's important too for people to understand that it isn't even like necessarily stories connected directly to our work that sometimes can have the biggest impact. But Mm -hmm. I would love if you would share that a little bit to give people context of how did you actually even come to know that there is this whole body of work that you could dedicate your life to around resilience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, so for all of us, you know, we have challenges starting from, you know, the day that we're born or Mm -hmm. pretty early on. And, you know, I think we find that many entrepreneurs had 
tough childhoods, experience difficult things early on. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, in one of his books, I think it's Outliers, he talks about this idea of the desirable disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So what he means by desirable disadvantage are the things that happen to us in our lives that are not desirable, we wouldn't have chosen them. I call these things reverse bucket list items. Mm -hmm. uh, the bucket list is all the pleasurable things we want to experience with the people that we love the most. Right. The reverse bucket list is all the stuff we hoped to avoid, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the issues with our product and service as an entrepreneur, the losses, the rejections, the end of a relationship, the um, so many people in the tech industry have been laid off recently, right? So job elimination and, and being in that moment of financial insecurity mm -hmm. and uncertainty. So mm -hmm. the reverse bucket list is all the things that we really hope to avoid in this life. Yeah. And, you know, many of them inevitably show up on our doorstep despite our best efforts to avoid them. Malcolm Gladwell, I think, means this when he talks about a desirable disadvantage. And these are the things that happen that would on their face seem to be a disadvantage. But ultimately, when we harness that moment of challenge can actually be used as an advantage. Mm. And so when he looked at I think the first 50 presidents of the United States, he found that 14 of the presidents lost a parent wow. in their childhood. So one third of the presidents of the United States essentially had lost a parent very early on, which is one of the most traumatic things mm -hmm. that can happen for a child. And so this is one of the ways that I think we get to recast our relationship with challenge. None of us want to lose someone that's close to us. Mm -hmm. None of us want to go through those difficult heart wrenching. It feels like the sea of life is just tossing us around out there in our little boat. And yet when we do, there's something that comes out of that where we get to see our strength. We get to see our capacity. We get to see what we're made of mm -hmm. in a new and different way. And when we talk about for us as women, right, there's research out there that says it's not every woman, but there's research out there, you know this research, that says the vast majority of women will not apply for a job unless they meet 100% of the criteria. So true. Right? However, I'm a person, I will look at a job description, and if I can do like 45 to 60% of it, I'm like, let's go. I'm one of the outliers in that mm. sense, right? But why is that? Mm. So you alluded to the story that I have growing up. So starting at age 14, I had a man come to my window, so creepy, in the morning while I was getting dressed for school. And, you know, it was dark outside. This is uh, the Midwest. You know, I'm getting ready to mm -hmm. take the bus to high school. So it's like 6, 7 a.m., so I go over to turn off my stereo. And um, for those of our listeners that don't know what a stereo is. We'll put is, a, a link in the show notes. Yes. Some education. Yes. See about us a after. stereo. Yes. Yes. For all, all <laughs> manner of obsolete devices, VCRs, <laughs> phone booths. And um, so I go to turn off my stereo. I'm listening to music. And there's this face at the bottom of my window. And, you know, I sort of freeze for a moment. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is happening here and make sense of this moment. And suffice it to say, he ends up speaking to me through, you know, kind of the crack in the open window and says, take off your clothes. You're beautiful. And so this freaked me out as a 14 year old. And I had this feeling like, um, I don't know if you ever watch like a scary movie and it just sort of feels like the walls mm -hmm. are Like my coming. heart's racing right now, just yeah. like hearing you retell the story. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I ran from my bedroom and called my parents and we called the police and the police say, ah, it's probably just someone passing through the neighborhood, probably just a fluke. And, um, so then fast forward about eight or 10 months later, I was in my bedroom again. And essentially, I was trying on some new clothes that I just gotten at the mall that day. And there was another window in the back of our house that um, I just kept open, you know, for ventilation. It was summertime now. And I heard his voice again. 
And he said, I've been waiting a long time for this. And I recognized his voice immediately. And the way that I tell this story is that for me, three things became true in that moment. One, I was naked in front of a man really for the first time. Two, it was a loss of innocence. Mm -hmm. You know, my childhood bedroom that should have been a safe place for me should be a safe place for everyone became profoundly unsafe. Mm -hmm. And three, I realized that this was not this was not a fluke. This was not um, just someone passing through the neighborhood. This was someone who was targeting me, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I once again started calling for help and having that feeling that the walls were closing in on me. And this time my parents were out of town and we had some babysitters upstairs that were playing with um, their young children and doing the nighttime routine so they couldn't hear me. So as I'm calling for help, he's standing outside my window. I don't have any clothes on. So I'm very like vulnerable and exposed in this moment. And he says to me, they can't hear you. No one is going to come and help you. And he was right, you know? So I picked up my phone in my bedroom and called 911 myself. And so this, you know, is one of my resilient stories. And it's a story where I can look at that moment and I can say, I showed up for myself. Mm. I picked up the phone and I called for help. But there's also been so many moments in my life where I have felt like I was on the brink of like just disaster, Mm -hmm. right? Starting my company a month before the pandemic would be one of those moments. And I feel like I'm calling for help literally or figuratively and like no one can hear me. And part of my healing has been to figure out how I can ask for help in a way that people can hear me and also to not get so triggered in those moments where I don't feel like people are showing up for me Mm -hmm. because I don't want his assessment of that moment to keep being true. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to feel like people want to show up and want to be of service. So, you know, I think this is a great example of how we get to integrate our resilient stories how we get to think about both the story and the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. We get to tell ourselves a story about that story and also the healing inherent in that or the opportunities to see things in a new and different way. And for me, it's been finding people in my life that I know are going to show up for me and be in my corner when I need them to be, that when I'm calling for help literally or figuratively, they will be able to hear me. That's important to me. Right. And the question that comes to my mind, because I can put myself in so many scenarios where even in the moment, I want to rush through to the healed version of me that's telling the narrative of my triumph and sees my resilience But there's a whole in-between process. And I I don't know if you go into this in your work, but I'd love to hear about, you know, there's the traumas in the moment. There's the things that happen in the moment. And then there's a whole process where we actually not just logically know I can choose to see that this happened for me, but where that's actually our, our living reality and our belief. I'm in a season right now where I'm even just looking at where things that I maybe know logically I haven't actually integrated into my embodiment of these lessons. And and this, I think, is such a powerful example of where there's sometimes a a whole path to getting to that point Mm -hmm. of what we would maybe look at as someone's resilient characteristics and say, gosh, I just want to be there already. Mm. I don't know if you have any guidance on that, but I would love to hear because that's the first thing that pops up into my mind is knowing my own journey with this and how I always want to fast forward to the resilient me that's telling this story so powerfully. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want to fast forward through all that like muck and darkness and difficulty and journaling and reflection and and introspection? 
Um, and I, you know, I think that's why, you know, it's really tempting to want to sort of spiritually bypass things or engage in toxic positivity, mm -hmm. which I think for me means not really connecting with the truth and the gravity of what's happened and um, just simply kind of whitewashing, mm -hmm. you know, things over the top. And I think one of the reasons that this idea of resilience hasn't resonated with a lot of people is because I think there's a lot of work out there that does whitewash or put varnish over, okay, this difficult thing happened and then we don't see anything else. And then on the other side, there's someone up on stage mm. telling their so story. True. And when we don't privilege and prioritize the journey and talk about the journey from you know, point A to point B, I think we do ourselves and we do other people a disservice. There's a struggle in there. The struggle is real and it is a vulnerable struggle. Mm -hmm. And it may not be something for our Instagram stories or for posts, but finding a way to be able to talk about that, even looking back, I think is really important. And for me, I've done a lot of work, you know, this story with this man and you know, having this experience where his behavior escalated and, you know, he was targeting me as a as a stalker and, and watching the house. Um, it's something that I've worked on for a number of years. Mm -hmm. He ultimately, um, unfortunately, when I went away to college, uh, physically attacked and raped another woman in our neighborhood. He went to prison for two decades. I spent time in captivity as well because I developed 20 years of post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. where I met the diagnosable uh, level for that. And so, you know, these are all things that I've been on a journey with. Um, something that I don't talk a lot about publicly is that my dad was in the FBI at the time. And... If you watch uh, the Netflix special about the Unabomber, you'll see that my dad was one of the agents that found the Unabomber in a cabin out in the woods in Montana. But my dad didn't find the guy that was terrorizing his daughter mm -hmm. who lived four houses away. And so for me, the, you know, one of the difficult parts of that journey has been how I think about my own worthiness, how I think about my own value when my father was able to find this sort of like nearly impossible fugitive, but yet he wasn't mm -hmm. able to find a person who lived in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And just the layers, I just got like full body chills as you're saying that because it's the truth is that there are so many layers to these stories that eventually become our resilience stories. And you've kind of we've touched a few times on the vulnerability piece of it. Mm -hmm. And I love how you speak about vulnerability in, in relation to resilience, because when I think about what keeps or has in the past kept me from sharing the stories that feel more vulnerable they could make a really big impact. It's because of this fear mm -hmm. that if someone knows, I'll just even use the business sense, we'll kind of bring this back to our sure. community. And I think even the, the beginning of Powerhouse Women is I saw there was this just this need to share more of the reality of like, this is not perfect and I am Girl. struggling daily. <laughs> and I thought, but who's going to then mm -hmm. not want to listen to me, but I was very concerned about how that would diminish my credibility mm -hmm. when it actually drew people in and and made them want to be a part of this conversation. The more I started to admit, wait, you all don't know what you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. And maybe other people need to hear that too. So will you talk about the vulnerability piece mm -hmm. and maybe where we have this misconception mm -hmm. about what vulnerability actually does for the impact that we can make? Yeah, I love that. It's such a it's such a great question. So the first thing that I want to say 
for us as entrepreneurs. And this feels really important for us to say out loud and to keep saying and to make sure the people in the back hear it mm-hmm. is that we get to decouple our product and service, our contribution, our offering to the world and our cash flow or the amount of revenue coming into our business for at least the first three to five years. And so for some people who are wondering, like, what does she mean by that? What I mean is you can have an amazing product, service, message, way that you are showing up and contributing in the world, Mm -hmm. and you can struggle with your cash flow and being on a 30-day burn rate for years. You know, especially if you decide not to take outside investment Mm -hmm. and bootstrap your business. I was on a 30 day burn rate for about 40 months. And define what burn rate means in case someone hasn't heard that term. Yeah. So um, burn rate means that you've got enough cash in your business to run it for whatever that defined period of Mm -hmm. time is. So if you've got a 120 day burn rate, it means you've got your salary, your operating expenses and the people that you're paying. You've got 120 days of that in your bank account. I was on a 30 day burn rate, which meant that every 30 days I needed to figure out where the cash was going to come from to fund myself, to fund my business and for all of the operating expenses. And I did that for about 40 months. Mm -hmm. And it was exhausting. It was exhausting. And to your point, you didn't say this exact thing, but to your point earlier, I felt like if I told people that cash was that tight and things were that hard, that it would discredit Mm -hmm the work that I was doing, the coaching, the consulting, the, you know, because people would think, oh, well, she must not be that good at what she does because financially it's a struggle right now. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm on the other side of this, you know, and oftentimes it's on the other side, sort of hindsight (laughs) being 2020 and, you know, cash flow is still a thing, right? As an entrepreneur, but being able to talk about that because Mm -hmm. I think what gets sold not here in Powerhouse Women, but what gets sold in the world of entrepreneurship are the vacations and the homes and the cars yeah. and the and all the things. And can we can we live a beautiful life as as entrepreneurs that we've dreamed of that is abundant? We absolutely can. And When we're bootstrapping that business, starting our new podcast, putting our digital course out into the world, financially, you know, the picture of what that looks like might look very different, right, than the quality of the product, service, offering, way that we're contributing, Mm -hmm. you know, to the world. And I think that's really important for us to get to get to talk about. That did not answer the question that you asked me. But it's, I'm grateful you talked about that because that's not just the exception. That's actually more of the rule if, like you're saying, someone is bootstrapping their business, which the majority of our community, if they're building something of their own, they are. And that's what I, that's the path I chose too. Yeah. That doesn't discredit your idea, your message. And I love how you framed that. And I I kind of forgot the original question, something about vulnerability. So I'll just let you go on that tangent <laughs> because, because that's the next piece of it, right, mm-hmm. is realizing that we don't have to pretend. I think that's also what can feel exhausting is mm-hmm. not only are you trying to keep the business afloat and figure out the next strategic move, but then... Mm-hmm putting the pressure on ourselves that we can't let anyone know. We can't ask for help or we can't have this group of, you know, this group of business besties, like we like to call them, where you can be like, this is really friggin' hard right now. Yeah. I mean, there was also a part of me because this is one of my resilience stories that very much felt that I was back in my childhood bedroom Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to call for help, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out this entrepreneurial thing, wondering who I could talk to and what I could say that, you know, would allow me to like get the help and support, you know, that I needed, but also not ignite anyone's, you know, red flags that I didn't know what I was doing or, you know, I was going to be in trouble, you know, in some way from like Mm -hmm. a cash flow perspective. But I think 
when we're able to talk about that, when we're able to, and, and I think part of it is the decoupling of, yeah, this is my product. This is my service. This is the way that I'm showing up in the world. This is the way that I feel called to serve. This is the way that I want to contribute. And, you know, I'm working on the business elements of optimization, of delegation, of automation, of, you know, figuring out how to make this whole picture come together for me financially. I stepped out of my executive role at Nike. I was heading executive leadership development and talent strategy. So I was working with the C-suite. I was working with the top 400 vice presidents. And I kept getting tapped on the shoulder, you know, figuratively from, you know, the universe, from God, from life Mm -hmm. saying, don't you want to do this on a broader scale, on a bigger platform outside of the sort of proverbial four walls of Nike? And I did. Wow. And so I ended up stepping out of Nike in February of 2020. Ha ha. So cute of us. (laughs) (laughs) It's so true, right? So the pandemic showed up a month later and all of the business that I'd sort of Mm. booked with friends and colleagues of mine that were heads of leadership development that were in the corporate world through a you know, a a handshake or a hug, you know, that all disappeared. Wow. And Mm. at the same time, my sons, who were five and seven at the time, were sent home from school to do virtual remote learning. And there was a period of six to seven months where I thought I was going to lose my house. You know, I had no income. I wasn't I wasn't even sure that like my business was necessarily going to work, let alone in the midst Mm -hmm. of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I remember having this conversation with myself in my own head where I was like, so if they repossess my house, would the kids come and see me like in a shelter or would I go see them at their dad's house? Like, how, how does that work when you don't have a home anymore. Like I I really was at a moment and and then, you know, Ariana Huffington proclaimed resilience was her word for the year and all of a sudden people were like resilience, what's that? And then, you know, the emails started coming in and the mm-hmm. you know, phone started ringing so to speak. Um but I think we all have these moments as as entrepreneurs and if I connect this to vulnerability Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of people are surprised to learn that when we think about the five practices of highly resilient people or the five things that when we face these inevitable moments of challenge, change and complexity, that there are practices, ways that we can show up in the world that are going to create a more positive and productive outcome. And the first practice that I learned from interviewing hundreds of people and collecting thousands of pieces of data and just getting to listen to people's story was vulnerability. And oftentimes we think vulnerability is the opposite of resilience. We think resilience is being unchanged. We think it's being Teflon. We think it's, you know, soldiering through and it isn't. And the first practice of vulnerability is also different than what we think because vulnerability is not about being self-deprecating. It's not about discrediting ourselves or pointing out our flaws before someone else does. Vulnerability is about allowing our inside self, our thoughts, our feelings, our experiences to match as closely as possible the self that we're sharing with the world. Which is so powerful. Can you, I'm actually going to have you say that one more time because when I learned this definition of vulnerability, it changed the way vulnerability resonates with me. Can Mm -hmm. you actually say that one more time? Yes. Everybody, make sure you're hearing this because this is so powerful. Say it one more time. Yeah. So vulnerability is allowing our inside self, our thoughts, our Mm -hmm. feelings and experience to as closely as possible match the outside self 
that we share with the world. Mm -hmm. And if we've spent any time in like mental health or therapy, sometimes we talk about congruence, the congruence of what's happening for us internally and how much of that we're allowing other people to see. So vulnerability isn't about discrediting ourselves, being self-deprecating, putting ourselves in a one down position, so to speak. Vulnerability is about having a connection where we allow people to see more, to know us more, to understand more what's happening on the inside and being willing and brave enough to allow that inside self to more closely match the outside self we share with Mm. the world. And why is that so important? Why is that the first quality of someone who's displaying resilience? Can you connect the dots there? Mm -hmm. It's such a great question. And I think it's so important because vulnerability does come with a high price tag. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of fear for us around that. There's something called the vulnerability bias that I uncovered. And that tells us that it's like a hardwired kind of way that our brains are taught to think, maybe even in like evolutionary uh, psychology, because as humans, we were physically reliant on one another for a long time. You didn't want to get separated from the human pack out on the prairie because you would perish. Mm. So you didn't want to do anything different. You didn't want to do anything weird. You didn't want to arouse any kind of suspicion. You wanted to stay with your fellow humans and not be ostracized. Well, today we don't really rely on one another for physical safety to that extent, but we do rely on each other for psychological and human connection, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the moment when we're going to share something vulnerable that feels like a risk for us, the vulnerability bias shows up in our mind and it says, "Uh uh-uh, don't tell those people that. And we're like, why not? Why not vulnerability bias? Mm -hmm. And it's like, why do I feel so threatened by the thought of this? Exactly. And the vulnerability bias says, well, Taryn, you know, if people really knew that thing about you, they wouldn't like you Mm. and they wouldn't love you and they might leave. I'm like, whoa, abandonment. It's getting serious, you know. And so these are the three these are the three L's of the vulnerability bias. And so when we have an awareness of that, we can actually train our brain to not listen to that cognition, because to your point, vulnerability is so important when we face the big three C's, the challenge, the change, the complexity, all the inevitable reverse bucket list desirable disadvantage moments that we hope to avoid because when we allow people to see what's going on on the inside, we get more information, we get more support, we get more access, right? It's everything that you're doing here in this community to say, let's bring us together and let's talk about what's real and let's talk about what's true and let's help each other Mm -hmm. because this is a really important, meaningful journey that we're all on. And it also gets really hard at certain points. Mm -hmm. But if we're not vulnerable enough to let some people know that we're going through a challenge, then we end up going through that moment with much less support and many fewer resources. Mm. And inevitably delaying the more painful parts of it. I can just share that from personal experience when Mm -hmm. I haven't been willing to let people in on what's really going on. Mm, Thanks for sharing that. Yes. I want to come back and kind of tie this all together with what we really started talking about, which is these resilience stories that Mm. that we actually all have. So someone is listening and thinking, well, I I don't have a story like that from childhood, or I don't have a story in my entrepreneurship journey, I'm just starting, where would someone go to look for their resilient stories and the things that maybe are actually supposed to be a part of their purpose to Mm -hmm. share them and open up and share that a little bit more? Mm, I love, I love this question so much. Well, I think the the sort of comparison that comes up around resilient stories Mm -hmm. is very real. And so people will hear like my scary stalker story and say like, well, I don't have anything like that. And I'm like, thank goodness for you, (laughs) you know, but we all have something and none of them is better 
or worse than another. It's just about fully integrating our experiences and accepting ourselves and accepting our stories. And when we want and need to also getting to write or rewrite a narrative Mm. about that story that supports, you know, the person that we're developing and growing into. So I think when you ask, you know, where can people sort of tap more into those stories, I think maybe sit down and think about, you know, what are the challenges that you've experienced? That's the first question or the changes or the complexities. That could be your family decided to move when you were a kid and you ended up in this new neighborhood and you were the new kid in school, right? I mean, it can be a variety of things. So what were some of those challenges, you know, that you faced? And then the second question is, how have those challenges formed you into the person that you are today? And that part is important too, because then we get thinking about, you know, not just seeing challenge as something negative, as something to be avoided, but we start to see challenge as a critical component of our formation, of our journey. And when we can tap into those resilient stories and begin to tell them to our friends, to our family members as part of maybe what is inspiring us to start our business or to develop a particular product or service, then we're also more deeply connected, I think, personally with what are the challenges that we've experienced in our lives. That creates a deeper connection, you know, because I think when we really get to see that someone's life isn't perfect, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's when we really have that human connection of like, oh, I can relate to this person, Yes, you know. So I think that's where I would start is to look at what are these moments where you've kind of had challenge and then how has that challenge formed you as a way to begin to access some of your resilient stories. We all we all have them. Nobody's hand is better than another, right? Just as Cheryl Strayed said, who wrote the book Wild, we just get to play the hell out of the hand that we're dealt. Ooh. And what I am hearing even in what you're sharing, not only are these stories important to connect with, to possibly share, mm-hmm. and that's obviously always a choice, but that by identifying those stories and really getting clear about what they've taught us, that reverse bucket list that you shared mm-hmm. so beautifully earlier, that's actually been a big source of confidence for me, mm-hmm. even if I don't share all of the resilient stories. Yeah actually taking the time to say, you know what this did teach me? Mm. You know what I learned from this? Oh, Mm -hmm. this one quality that I love about myself Mm -hmm. that really did kind of come from how I was treated in school or the fact that I was super awkward or whatever that is. And just what power and confidence that can give us to go out there and do the most vulnerable thing in the world, which is to put your ideas on Mm -hmm. display Mm -hmm. and offer them up for the world like so many people listening to this podcast are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is such a powerful addition to the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add one more thing on top of that, because we are talking about a community of of women. I think every woman out there has probably had at least one not positive experience with another woman or another group of women. And It's really, I think, incumbent upon us as women to lead the charge for the next generation Mm -hmm. and to not bring some of the old stories with us into this next generation. What do I mean by old stories? What I mean is, I think as women, we can be taught from an early age to see someone who is successful, who is attractive, who has an advanced degree, you know, whatever it is, Mm. you know, to see that person across the room and to say, that's my competition. Mm -hmm. I think that comes very naturally to us as women. Mm -hmm. Um, It also comes very naturally to us to see someone and to say, that person's threatening. Or that person's intimidating. 
right? But instead, as we think about the new the new guard of women, the new chapter, yeah. right, is to see that woman across the room and to recognize that there's something about her that we're excited about, that we're that we aspire to become and say, that's not my competition. That's actually my next business partner. Mm. That's my next collaborator. That's my next mentor or friend tour, right? And and also to take responsibility for our own responses to seeing women succeed. Mm. You know, other women are not intimidating. We get intimidated. Yes. Other women are not threatening. We get threatened. And so we get to take responsibility for what that reaction is that we're having and then work with one another in a way that we allow, you know, the the tide to lift all boats. And mm-hmm. I think that's important in this community because the challenge, the change, the complexity, it is inevitable. And when we can come together and support one another in those difficult moments, yeah. but also more importantly, in the successful moments, mm-hmm. that is powerful. I say a good friend is there for us when we're down, right? There's lots of good friends that'll come over when things aren't working out and I'm crying. And and it's just, you know, I feel like I've been taken to a difficult place. A great friend is there for us when we're up. A great friend is a person who can celebrate our success with us and we can celebrate success with them with a pure heart. And I think that is really important for us as women. That's so, so well said and so beautifully said. There's so much more goodness in your book and in some of the things that you're working on right now. So I want to make sure we we save space for you to share a little bit about that, where people can connect with you, where they can get the book. We'll link your TED Talk and all the resources in the show notes as well. But you're also working on just some really exciting projects that this is kind of a perfect segue. I want to take a moment to celebrate and to give give you the floor to really talk about. So I'll let you kind of start with wherever the best place for people to connect with you is if they want to just be more in your world and mm. and learn from you. Thank you. Well, I think Instagram is a great place to connect. Um, there's lots of I think really great free content there. I think a lot of our people in this community are already there on Instagram. So that's amazing. Um, So I'm Dr. Taryn Marie there. And then one of the things that I've been working on is um, a compilation book called uh, Triumphs of Transformation. So Mm. lots of people came to me last year and said, wow, I really want to become a best-selling author like you have. I want to share my resilience story. I'm a little scared to do that, mm-hmm. but you know, I want to give it a try. And so we are putting together a compilation book of 30 authors who are all going to share their resilient wow. stories in an uplifting thank you in an uplifting amazing. way. So you can kind of think stories of resilience meets chicken soup. I was going to say soul. I'm like not to again date ourselves, but it's giving chicken soup for the soul but the new empowered version really reminding people how resilient we all are yeah oh yeah so is this something you're still taking authors and stories and potential contributors for yes oh how exciting yeah we've got a couple more seats for authors to come and join us and to be part of this book and we'll yeah um you know sell those copies and put this out into the world in a way that we can engage in that alchemy of taking some of the darkest moments and Mm -hmm. be you know as Brene Brown says becoming part of someone else's survival guide shining that light of our experience so that it illuminates someone else's journey. And then, you know, also we're going to um, allow each author in the book to become a best-selling author to be able to distribute this book at a level where you get to be a best-selling author on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and, and USA Today. So, so I learned incredible. all that in my book process last year and I'm so happy to share it with other people. It's such a journey. It Uh, really is. And we'll we'll link your book in the show notes and make sure that people know where to get that. 
as we've been wrapping up here, I'm like, oh, wow, this last question that we have all of our beautiful guests answer really is an opportunity for people to share their resilience stories. We call it a powerhouse moment. Mm -hmm. And it's really an opportunity just for you to to pause right now and celebrate something, maybe even super small that has happened recently that you realize you haven't just paused to give yourself acknowledgement for. And then Mm -hmm. everyone listening gets this moment as well to think about something that they've overcome or a challenge they've just faced really bravely, anything that you would consider a powerhouse moment that you want to publicly right now celebrate with us. I love it. Oh, gosh. Powerhouse moment that I want to celebrate right now. How fun. How fun. Well, you know, I want to celebrate being here with you, Lindsay. Um, I want to celebrate this community that you've created bringing women together, having important, meaningful, honest conversations. In my life, I have not always had the best experiences with other women. Mm. And I have found myself definitely in the past couple of years really pulling back from being a part of community with other women just Mm -hmm. because I've had so many not good experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's almost just felt like too scary, too hard to like show up and try again. I feel that. And you feel that as well. Mm -hmm. And so what I would love to celebrate in this moment is showing up, getting to be here with you, getting Mm -hmm. to be part of this community inside of this uh, podcast episode. Um, you know, for sort of how do how do we say strapping up my boots or something and, yeah. and giving it a giving it a try yes. again. You know, I think I've turned down a lot of invitations to be part of women's mm-hmm. groups. Mm-hmm. And I think what you have created, the purity of your heart, the clarity of your vision mm-hmm. has made me say yes to showing up again in a way that I haven't for some time. Oh, that was so beautifully vulnerable of you to share. And I'm so grateful that we finally are getting to connect. And, you know, it's it's sort of like a thing now. I think it's the Midwest in me. It's just you just meet once and then you're kind of best friends. So yeah. And we exchanged friendship bracelets before we started this. So I think that's I think that's official. But it's official. I'm just really grateful for your work, for your heart, for your courage and your vulnerability because they impacted me today and I know so many mm. others listening. So thank you for being here. Mm. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor.